So uh, I was writing that you we kept you for the end because the, you, because you will you will present some amazing stuff, uh, amazing fact, and the fact that you're doing amazing research in what you're doing at the Civil School of Aviation and all around the world. Uh, actually, where you're working, where you are working because you're a researcher, a professor, and uh, leading the interactive data visualization group of the French Civil Aviation University uh, here in Toulouse. Your range of research is so wide. You, you cover explainable uh, uh, artificial intelligence, um, big data, uh, storytelling. You have written books like this book, which is really great, uh, with many very also good uh, scientists in data visualization, like Nathalie Rich and, uh, and uh, Sheila Carpendale. Uh, you have written lots of paper, and, and you will present uh, under the title very general, and I thank you a lot for that. That is data-driven storytelling and data emerging presentation uh, and data emerging technology, which which I have seen a few of that, and I think it's it's really interesting and very new. So uh, the floor is yours, Christophe, and thank you. So thanks for uh, for this introduction. Uh, now I feel the pressure. So I hope that I won't disappoint uh, you with what I'm going to, to present. So let me start to see if I can share the right screen. So thanks for, for, for this introduction. And, uh, and uh, in fact, the talk that I'm going to, to give today is something that uh, is not really brand new, but is that I assemble uh, the, the, the recent results uh, we, we had regarding the, the new publication we had uh, last year and this year. And I'm trying to make something coherent and uh, especially for, for the audience. So I understood that uh, some part of the audience knows about code. Some are, are more interesting into uh, just data visualization or maybe just bank. So uh, there will be a bit of everything for, for, for everyone. I will try not to be uh, too technical. I know that my presentation may be too long, so maybe I will accelerate uh, at the end, but I have a time area that will tell me uh, if I'm, I'm getting, and it's really, really too long or, or, or thing like that. So um, maybe just a few words about uh, where I work and what, what, what I did and what I'm, I'm trying to do now. So I've, uh, as Christophe said, so I'm in Toulouse uh, leading this data visualization group. So this is a nice picture of the campus. So please come and visit me. And uh, also we are really happy to invite uh, researchers or people, practitioners that have something interesting to share because also at ENAC we have economic groups, uh, we have data visualization, human computer uh, interaction, uh, and also we have a uh, pilot air traffic controllers. So all of this ecosystem around aeronautic uh, skills. And um, so let's go right into the topic. And uh, uh, this, uh, I, I really love this image and uh, it's pretty old now, 2009, but uh, it, went, it was when I did my PhD and uh, they asked me just to display this uh, big data set, which is one day of recorded aircraft trajectories. And, uh, and at that time, it wasn't that easy because it's almost one million uh, records. And uh, it's pretty hard to do that just because the screen doesn't have enough pixels to show all of this information. And, and, and w w when you do so, you end up with these images where you can see all of these lines. So I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. Uh, but anyway, right in the center of the screen, you have here, this is the Paris area. Uh, you can see this very dense airport. And you have also here Lyon and Toulouse, where I work. And also you have this uh, high altitude airlines, which are in blue. And, and when you see this image, uh, except the fact that it's nice, uh, it shows you as well something not expected is that you can see the outline of France here. And as a recall, this is only pure aircraft victories that are display here. So it means something that aircraft fly around the French coastline. And that's something that we know as uh, aeronautical practitioners but that's something that was not uh, obviously expected. It's just that there's plenty of tiny airplanes, which are private pilots, that does these uh, small flights and they are going around the French coastline because it's just nice. So uh, this is just a, a, a gist uh, about what data visualization can be helpful uh, for. Um, so later on, a uh, few years uh, after this work, we, we emphasize this big data visualization with interactive systems, so this time, we're just looking at this specific area around Paris, and we use this interactive system going from the top view to the vertical view, and just to filter um, the, the aircraft trajectories. And in this um, example, we use particle system to show the directions of the, the airflows, and it's, it's really helpful to do this selection and really to, um, to understand 
the complexity of um, uh, this dense uh, data set. We also did some type of, um, we call that analytics, uh, visual analytics, where we want, for instance, to compare two flows of aircraft landing in the south and north of Paris. And, uh, and all of this um, is helpful for reasoning, but also uh, decision uh, making. Uh, there is some other works that we have been conducting because when we're dealing with big data, of course, uh, we end up with very dense, complex uh, uh, visualization and structure. And uh, so we have been developing a lot of uh, algorithms to do some uh, data simplification. And this is uh, one of the examples where we have one year of traffic movements. People just uh, change location and we end up with this big black, uh, black uh, area where we don't see much. And we apply edge bending techniques. So there's many algorithms and, and that one is Till today, the, the, the one that is scalable and is able to, to deal with very, very large data set, like uh, 22 million vertices, but it can go up to bazillion, maybe even now there's no more limits uh, uh, about that. So I can show you uh, how this algorithm works with this uh, very funny animation where everything gets aggregated. But what is, in, what is interesting with such techniques is that when you start it, uh, let's see if I can go back. Yes. When we start with something that complex, at the end, you make some information emerge from the visualization, and that's that one of the key of this uh, data visualization uh, purposes. I can show you another one that I, I like also a lot. It's, uh, it's quite old, but it's again, it's, it's trying to push uh, even uh, further this notion of uh, interactive data visualization and uh, dealing with this big data set, which is a, a 3D scan, and going back and forth between the histogram of the density of this, uh, this scan and where you can do direct manipulation of the histogram saying, okay, I don't want low density uh, uh, voxels and, and then I can go back and forth like this and doing some really, really strange uh, transitions and animation to, for instance, to reveal, uh, to unveil the, the scale of, um, of this uh, to this scan. So all, all, all of this uh, introduction, which is a bit long, uh, is about um, what is a mantra when you're dealing with big data sets? Well, it's as Benjamin said uh, before, is uh, overview first and then details on, on demand for sure. Uh, but there's special things you have to keep in mind when you want to deal with scalability. And thinking scalability is not something something easy. And, uh, and uh, having something scalable means that you want maybe to remove some part of the data. And it's not always a good thing. Or maybe you want to distort part of the data with aggregation. And again, this may be not a good thing as well because you're going to, to change uh, the data by, 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 by itself. So one of the key that uh, our group uh, is trying to work on is to keep the human in the analytic loop. So anything that the computer does, a computer has, have, it has to explain to you what is happening. And that, that's the key. And uh, this is, also what Christophe said regarding this transparency in algorithm. That's one of the, and the major challenge today about uh, understanding the, the data process. And uh, one final word regarding uh, this, uh, uh, this big data uh, issue. Uh, there, it seems to be uh, kind of a law, like the, the more law, uh, explaining that uh, the, the computer's power never stop uh, increasing, but maybe there's also this interactive or big data uh, law where it says that, uh, in fact, today we still have limitations regarding the data, the, the, the amount of data you can display on the screen, but just because you have a given amount of pixels on the, on the screen. So it gives you basically the range about the number of items you can, you can display. You end up with a 10 a billion, a million uh, pixels, uh, and then you can uh, display 10 million items. But there's also something that is very interesting. Displaying information is important for sure but also interacting with this data is also uh, important. And today we have this kind of uh, linear uh, effect uh, with the new generation of graphic cards that never stop increases, increasing in terms of power. And then you can deal with more and more data and it's, uh, it, it's, it's still going on uh, even, even today. So um, what, what, what are the next challenges uh, today regarding big data? In fact, the challenges are still with this amount of data you can display, but it comes with these novel technologies that I'm really fond of, uh, with this uh, mixed reality and virtual reality or augmented reality. And this is going, uh, what I'm trying to, 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 to push here and to show you what we can do with this technology. So uh, first, 
I, I will be very quick on that because I know that many of you are familiar with these uh, technologies, but um, you have the, the, let's go for the uh, mixed reality with the HoloLens device. It's like the Google Glass, but not exactly the same thing. Uh, you, you, you wear the device and then you can see holograms in your, in your uh, environment, but it's in your environment so that you can see outside and where you are. Uh, uh, this is not the same with the virtual reality headsets where you are immersed with, uh, in your environment and you don't see the outside of, the, uh, of, of your environment, except that you, now you have the see-through devices, but I, I won't talk too much uh, about this. So what can we do with these devices? So the virtual reality one, the ones that, uh, that shelters you from your environment, it's really powerful. So I hope that you can see the, the video, it should be, should be good. Uh, so it's an example that I, I picked on, uh, on YouTube where your user is wearing the device so here you have a dancer where you capture the movement and then you mix um, the environment. You, you try it and nevertheless uh, to get some of the inside from the outside world toward the, 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 the device. But by the way, you don't see anything away from your, your, your device. So here comes this other technology with this mixed reality and the HoloLens and now the HoloLens 2, where you have holograms that are encoded in your environment. So uh, here, this 3D map is really glued to uh, the wall. And when you move your head, the, 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 the image still is on the wall. So it makes a huge difference with, uh, with other technologies like uh, the, the, the Google Glass. So I like this, uh, this video because it comes from artists that try to push um, to the maximum uh, what we could do with uh, this type of mixed reality technology. So I imagine that uh, you are wearing this, uh, this super uh, fancy glasses and here is what you you look so there is a uh, there's this mix between a lot of virtual objects that are encoded in your environment and all these objects will interact with you and will help you and will uh, accommodate uh, with uh, your current location and with uh, what you want to do and what you're trying to do like here doing some shopping and so on so this is great for sure but what can we do with this with data visualization so we have this uh, field, which is called immersive analytics, where uh, they try, we try to take advantage of uh, these devices and to see what we can do as a way to leverage user ability to see, interact, and take decisions uh, with, uh, with, with, with data uh, visualization and interaction. So um, I will next present to you three papers uh, we have been working on in, in, that, in that direction. So I will start with that one, um, which is a pretty funny, uh, it's a collaboration with Microsoft Research. And, uh, and we, we, we started just with some kind of a, not really a joke, but we said, okay, can we capture the main difference between a 2D screen and a virtual reality environment where we, where, when we just basically show data? So we say, okay, let, let's design this simple tool. One tool in VR, in VR where we, we draw things, another one where, where we draw as well things on a 2D screen. So um, it works. Uh, we, we, we took our inspiration from this um, infographics visualization, and I'm sure a lot of you know about Dear Data, and this is really fantastic where two uh, artists, so I hope that it won't be the sound here, but Okay, I will mute the, the video to be sure. Where two artists decided to uh, exchange data visualization, but they are living apart. One is living in the US, the other one was living in, uh, is still living in the, in the UK, and they send postcards about the emotion of the day through data visualization. So for instance, uh, Georgia decided to say, okay, the topic today is about a love that I, I can express to my husband. And uh, so every time I want to express some love to my husband, I will just draw a uh, heart, right? And, uh, and Stephanie did the same. And so they, they build this postcard and send them back to each other. And, uh, and you know, this is really fantastic. You can buy the book, by the way. You can go, maybe not today, uh, not right now, to the MoMA, because now this is an exhibition and where you can see all of these uh, very beautiful drawings. Uh, this is really fantastic. I'm a big fan of that. So, okay, we, we, we did not <laughs> manage to do something as fancy as they, they, they did. But uh, we, we tried to capture uh, something regarding the emotion of the user using this uh, fancy uh, new technology. And uh, 
So we wanted to assess uh, how enjoyable an experience in data visualization could be and, uh, and try to maximize user engagement um, when dealing with data visualization. And therefore, we use this pictograph. So this is all of these icons that you can glue together to, to create some groups and, uh, and you can do some reasoning with, with them. And we compare uh, 2D visualization versus uh, immersive visualization. So it works like this. We, we designed this, uh, this setup. Uh, and um, OK, let's let make it really clear. So we had 12 participants. And we, we told them, imagine that you collected uh, during the last three months your emotions uh, with, within three categories. Could be neutral, uh, happy, or sad. And, and then what we're going to show you is these emotions. So we gathered your personal information and you're going to show, we're going to show them, but you, you, you are free to choose how you want them to be displayed. So that's why here you have three square where you can draw whatever you want. And here are the pictograph uh, corresponding to the amount of average, happy or sad emotion you feel during the, 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 the few months. And so we did these two experimentation, one in VR and one uh, on the 2D screen. So I will show you how the user managed to draw things. Uh, if you never tried that before, really, it's really fantastic. It's super, super fun. So and now you can do that in VR. You can do that also uh, in, a, in a virtual environment in a, with, with the HoloLens. So now the, the user is drawing something neutral. So the bad thing is that it's flat right now because the video is flat, but it's actually in 3D. And also the ability to move the head like this is super, super helpful. And you can see on the background, the corresponding emotions uh, the, that have been captured regarding your, uh, your, your, your feeling that are displayed on the background. So, so what is important here is more what we managed to extract from, from, from this. And uh, it was really, really fun experience. And we didn't know actually uh, what, what, what we would get from this experimentation. So uh, have a look at the paper to see all of these uh, beautiful drawings that people have been, have been doing. But I think that the lesson learned from this is that, well, uh, it's a bit harder to draw in 3D in VR. It's a little bit harder for the user to spend time uh, in, in VR, but it's okay. They spend more time in VR than in 2D for the same task here. Uh, in terms of quality of data understanding, it's exactly the same. So, which is super positive here because if you can do VR, let's do it. I mean, it won't it won't be any harm to to for for for, for data visualization. But what is important, and I think what what is the strongest part strongest part of the paper is that the user, user were definitely more engaged in VR. And it's not just the fact that this is a novel technology. It's also the fact that when you think about something and you can draw it in 3D, then you get into a mindset that is uh, introversal. And then you get back to your memories. And everything you're going to draw is related to past memories, which, create, which creates engagement. And this is one of the... Um, expected somehow insight we managed to, 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 to gather, but we, we, we prove it. And it was very encouraging to push a little bit further uh, this uh, VR data visualization. Uh, so here is uh, the link to, to, to get uh, the, the experiment and everything. So um, let me show you the next paper I want to talk about, because we wanted to push that a little bit further, try to capture this set of uh, this immersive uh, feeling. And uh, uh, we, we, we came up with this paper, uh, again, with this uh, collaboration of Microsoft and Benjamin, uh, who did a fantastic work here. And we managed to extract this notion of visceralization. So it's hard to pronounce, but it's super strong. And uh, this is a way that we managed to feel something uh, regarding the data because we are immersed in this 3D environment. So it comes from this uh, paper, uh, so some of you know very well because it's uh, Siegel and Ear uh, regarding the way to do some narrative data storytelling. And uh, we have different types of narration you can do with a magazine style. You can annotate a chart, you can do flow chart, the comic strips. It's really fun to, uh, to, to, to do. And uh, the way that uh, you can communicate with the data with different ways, and I like this notion of concrete scale where you use unitization, a little bit like this, uh, this pictograph that, uh, with this uh, 
uh, sugar cube that shows you the amount of sugar that is actually in a, in a bottle or in a Kit Kat or, or, or whatever. And also this notion of you take the data and you make it, uh, you, you create a physical representation of them with this data physicalization. So that, that's really great, right? Except that uh, to create this physical data, sometimes it's really difficult. It takes a lot of time. Why? In VR, everything is possible. So let's see if it's possible to create the same notion of data understanding uh, in VR that we could do uh, with physical uh, objects. So that's, okay, I will, ooh, I will show you this uh, experimentation. If, you, if you've never seen them, it's really fantastic. Uh, again, so uh, of course, if you are afraid of height, don't do that ever uh, because it, uh, <laughs> you may be traumatized forever. Uh, so, but the, the idea is the following. Okay, you take a lift and then you end up here. So that's VR, right? Uh, and that actually you are in a room just on, 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 on this uh, wood stick, and, uh, but the wood stick is moving. So, wow, wow, super scary. So believe me, right? I tried it. There is no way to convince yourself you're, you're, you're just in the game, right? It's, uh, it's so, it's, it, it's really in your mind. It's really everything around you. So, and that's, really, that's something super, super strong. So we know this and we wanted to push that a little bit further. So since I'm talking here with, with people dealing with banks, so maybe you, 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 you've seen that one. It's also a bit fun. Uh, it's a NASDAQ curve. And uh, let's do some roller coaster on this NASDAQ curve. So, uh, so they, uh, it's, it's a bit of a, of a toy. Uh, I'm not sure it's super efficient, but it helps us to, uh, to design the, the, the experimentation I'm going to, uh, to, to show you. So now you climb the curve, but the idea is, is when you end up to the top of this curve, you end up on the top of the hill, right? And then when you're going to descend and that, that the big, big crash, right? So is there a way to communicate data with the emotion relating to a physical emotion or physical um, feature that you could have experimented? So here we come. So here is the, the, the idea beyond that. We take data, we have data visual, visualization, and we add a layer on that. Uh, to leverage our, our, our feeling about this data. And uh, so that for, we identified uh, different feelings or different notions that we can map on the data. Could be speed, could be distance, could be scales. Uh, and then we, we also investigated things that are a little bit harder because they are more abstract, like money, which are abstract quantities, or discrete quantities, like numbers, big numbers. Or extreme scales that are, that things are these things are, are sometimes difficult to, to assess or, or to compare. Uh, so here are the results. We built some uh, VR experimentations where you just wear the device and then ah here we go. This is all the fastest runners in the world. And then you 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 just you're just running with them. And then you you feel it except that you're not running. But even though you see how fast they are, they, they, they are. Uh, this is a crowd. Okay, let's do that. You can see the crowd from above, like this. Wow, big crowd, not that big, we don't know. And then you would get into the crowd. How do you feel? So this is all of this notion uh, that we, we simulated uh, and we, we try to be as realistic as possible. I also like that one, so there's uh, uh, six of them. I don't know how many I put here, but uh, how high are these buildings? How can you compare the size of the Eiffel Tower my favorite, of course, and the Space Needle, for instance, which I like also a lot. And um, so it's, uh, it's this notion about uh, feelings or assessments that we wanted to, 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 to retrieve. And uh, it's true that the 2D visualization is, is super efficient to compare the size of these towers, uh, but we wanted to get the subtle differences of the size perception and, um, and, uh, and the usage of this novel technology. So I'm just checking the time, if I'm right. Uh, okay, so this notion is also fun because it's uh, abstract visualization with the U.S. depth. So some of you maybe see, seeing the, the um, it's not a comics, uh, but it's a 2D visualization of these piles of bills on top of each other to show how the huge uh, the U.S. depth is. So in fact, all the buildings around the Statue of Liberty are uh, piles of bills. So can you imagine that? It's just, it just, just crazy. Um, okay. So, uh, what we managed to extract from this is the following. Um, well, we, we, uh, the, the layer we add with this visualization is not fundamental. It means that we still 
perceive the data a little bit different. And, 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 and that's it. Uh, and it's also working with some differences uh, between the actual world or, or, and then something more abstract like this. These runners, we can change them into these cubes and we will still perceive this notion of speed, uh, which is interesting. Um, there are things that are a little bit harder to understand and even for the, the, the human scale uh, with this size, which is not that easy to perceive for real or in VR, so we are really, really close. And even it's, um, it's harder with this notion of a big quantity and, and, and scale. So all of these uh, insights are discussed in the paper, so I, I won't have enough time here to get uh, along all of them, but uh, there's notion that are super important for sure, annotation of this virtual environment is one of the key for a better understanding. So what, um, uh, as a takeaway message is that, it worth it, really it worth it, because it will, as I previously explained in the, in the, in the uh, Giadala paper, it add this layer of uh, user engagement uh, for sure, uh, but also here it gives this, this additional feeling uh, that helps the user to get a better understanding of the data, to, to grasp it and to really feel it. So, uh, so that, that's something interesting, but we know that it has a price and the price is um, how can we build this, this uh, uh, experiences? It's not, it's not super easy to do it, even if today you have a, uh, not API, but uh, environment like Unity that can be very, very helpful to, to build these systems, but it takes nevertheless a lot of time. Okay, I take the time. Um, I think I'm, I'm good and I'm time to, to, to go on with uh, the third paper I wanted to discuss with you uh, today, which, which was called the fiber clay and um, because uh, in fact this paper is older than the two previous one but it's good to put that last because it shows uh, that VR or immersive environment have some assets that were to be used and why do we want to use them is to leverage user ability to understand the data and that's what we, we have been doing here back with this aircraft territory analysis so uh, we developed this system to display large data sets in 3D and where the user can do some direct manipulation of, of the data with brushing technique, with a preset navigation where you change the layout of the system and then you, uh, okay, let's play the, the video. I think it would be uh, easier to talk about, about that. So you have the user here, again, exploring these uh, tra 3D trajectories, but the world is flat and then you make it 3D. So the main difference is that now you are looking at the screen, but the actual, uh, the user is actually immersed in this environment here. And, um, and then the user can do some manipulation like rotation, for sure. The user can investigate specific parts of the data set. This is Paris area. You can rotate around this Paris area. So maybe I can make, oops, if I can hear it, a small stop here. Uh, you can see that around Paris, you have this fuzzy area and, uh, <clears throat> Again, this is something that we were aware of, but this was the first time we managed to see that for real, this is all private pilots that are not allowed to fly over Paris, so they are to, to fly around Paris, which creates, this, which creates this very dense area around Paris. Uh, you have this direct manipulation with scaling particle system to really understand the density and, uh, and so on. So this system is, is uh, um, interesting because it gives a novel perspective for the data visualization. And uh, uh, if you get through the paper, and I'm not sure we get through the whole video, but um, it managed, it helped us to discover new things that were hidden in this, in this data set. It's not really hidden, is that the data set is super dense and then it's, it's hard to find something that is small. And, and I will give you this example. So the user is, okay, let me go back a little bit here. The user in, is here investigating specific aircraft, aircraft going from Paris to Toulouse. So the user uh, points with his uh, controllers these two areas. Then the data is 3D. The user can adjust the view, do some rotation, and adjust the selection by removing the thing that had been selected and which doesn't make sense uh, for the user. So doing some rotation. Here, okay, I will pause here. Oops, can I go back a little bit? 
So usually I do this demo live, but you can understand that today is not possible. Uh, so this is uh, Toulouse on the left, this is Paris on the right, and uh, X axis, uh, uh, Y axis is the altitude. And you can see that you have a lot of aircraft flying high altitude except two uh, of these aircraft. And these two aircraft are actual, oh, the video has been, uh, has been cut, I'm sorry. But these two aircraft here are actually outliers. And, and then with the same technique, we can remove all the high altitude aircraft and investigate these two aircraft. And then you will discover that there's an aircraft that did something really, really strange. We can barely see it here. It's going high and then going back down. And, and, and even when it tried to land, it, it landed twice, in fact. Uh, so this is exactly the thing that we are looking for uh, when uh, it's difficult uh, to see uh, uh, something very specific in a data set just because the data by itself is so dense that it hinders the, the visualization of, uh, of small items. So thanks to virtual reality like this, it's easy to 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 push forward and, and to clear the, the visualization. Uh, okay, um, sorry, I just pushed twice back and I should not um, switch, switch. Okay, let's move. Okay, so um, just for you, I, I did the, this really quick uh, trial a uh, few days ago where I say, well, so since I'm, I'm dealing with, uh, with uh, uh, financial data uh, for this presentation, maybe I can, I can find some data set uh, that was to be investigated. So you will see that I'm far from being a bank expert. So what I'm going to show you is really bad, uh, but it doesn't matter. It's just to highlight what we could do uh, using VR with, for instance, the stock market data set. So I just went online on this website. Maybe you know it, I, I'm sure it's super famous. And I just say, okay, give me all the NASDAQ that I said for 20 years. Oh my gosh, that's a lot, right? And then I send that to my computer. I don't remember the site, but that's pretty big. It took, it, took, it took a while to extract the data. And you know the process. You just collect the data, then you do some data cleaning. And that's what, 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 what I tried because when I look at the data, I expected something like that. But in fact, I end up with something like this, which is, oh my God. I don't know, it's not good. There's something definitely wrong here because that's the time and here you have the values and you have at least two outliers uh, which just spoiled my view. So thanks to really simple interactive data, I just brush these areas and remove this data. But again, this data cleaning, it's, it's easy to do as long as you know what to do, right? So that's where data visualization is really helpful. When you have new data set, just show it and then you decide what to do with it. So after the cleaning, you end up with this, which is dense, and uh, it's, well, it's hard to find something interesting to dig with that, except that you can see that the prices of the stock market never stop to, to increase, well, no matter what it means. Uh, but what I did is the following. I just injected that in, in VR, like this. And uh, so you have the time here, the stock values here, and then I'm going to extrude and to spread all the, the values along this uh, axis going toward me. Mm. Okay. And in fact, that's super cool to do that uh, because you can just swim into the data if you really want to. Uh, I'm not sure that's super helpful, but why not? And then uh, you just use these two pointers uh, to select, okay, I want to check the price that the, the stocks that never stop growing or the one that have the, the highest rate. And that's what I did here really quickly. And this is direct manipulation and, uh, and uh, dynamic queries. And I extracted this. So sorry, I checked online. I, I don't know who is it. Uh, I think that company uh, fixing cars, but I'm, I'm not sure. But no, no matter what, never stop to, 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 to climb, which is good. Happy for them. Okay. So and now let's try the opposite. So you see, that's one of the issues of this uh, technique. It's just that you have some jitters with the controllers. So sometimes it's hard to do some selection, but this can be easily fixed. And then you end up with this company that have a high value and then go very, very low. And uh, I don't remember, I checked online, I think that's a, uh, that's a network uh, company uh, with software development, uh, still, still, uh, still working. But you, you know that this, this price is not that important compared to the amount of stock exchange or, or overs dimension of the data that was to be investigated. But that was just for, 
for uh, demonstration purposes that I did that. But when you look deeper at the data like this, just random visualization, you see something a bit weird, especially these vertical lines going a bit up everywhere. So if you zoom in a little bit more, you see that there are some curves that have this, I don't know, this uh, up and down, which is not possible because there is no, I mean, that, that's basically errors in the, in, in the data, that's issue in the data. And what I want to highlight here is that even if I did some data cleaning, there is still errors that I did not manage to capture. And just because I'm investigating the data a little bit deeper, I can find them. So through this very simple example, I show you all the pipeline between I capture the data and I do some exploration. And the only thing where I'm not good at here is to get um, a, a true uh, lesson learned uh, from the data because I'm not an expert in, in banking, but I'm sure you are. So uh, I will finish my talk here uh, with uh, future directions. Uh, uh, with all the things that uh, I told you about with this big data visualization, uh, with this uh, novel technologies. And, uh, and today um, uh, we said that we are surrounded by data. The data, are every, data is everywhere and it will never stop to grow, right? And uh, we also know that we will face big issues regarding the data processing. But don't worry, there is one solution, which is uh, artificial intelligence that uh, that would provide us new tools to just compute, process, and even take decisions for us. And uh, for sure, well, this is what will happen. You take data, you process the data, and you end up with this decision. But uh, what is going on, and we know that this is a big issue with uh, AI, is this black box effect, uh, because we don't know most of the time what the processing has been. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes, the rationale behind the decision is more important than the decision itself. So I will give you a basic example. I'm working with air traffic controllers. And for sure, the computer can compute a good way to modify the trajectory of, uh, of this, this aircraft and to avoid collision, right? Uh, but but the, the, the question is not, okay, let's turn this aircraft right, but the, 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 the real thing we're looking for is just tell me why. And it's not as complex as, hey, if you go left, you will collide with the other one. No, it's more, far more complex than that. Decisions which are made by air traffic controllers rely on, on, on multiple criteria, and especially optimization, and even and, and, and in the future, sustainability issues are, are the main concern uh, regarding uh, uh, aircraft management. And so uh, giving the order to an aircraft is far not enough to understand what's going on in two. To, to, to be sure about the decision. So it comes also with uh, software trustability and computer trustability and human computer interaction as well. And uh, so uh, what we're trying to do is to open this black box. So it's, it's not super novel for sure, but we turn these black boxes in, into gray where we say for sure, give us a decision, but maybe it's not a decision. Uh, it's a, maybe a recommendation, something like that. But what is most important is the explanation that comes with this. Um, some of you already know uh, these examples and, uh, with this uh, adversarial network where, uh, for instance, uh, ImageNet uh, network is this ba uh, data bank where you have a lot of images and now we are able to, uh, to classify all of these images, which is really great and amazing. And even the human being is not as good as uh, these uh, CNN networks. Uh, but uh, something weird could happen is that you take this image and you add this patch of colors right here. And even if we can see the stop here, Without this patch of color, the computer says, yes, that's a stop sign. But with this patch of color, it says, well, it's a yield, or it's a, I don't know, whatever, it's a speed limit. So the same for here, or the same for this animal, or this table that can be turned into a chair right, right away. And what is happening with this? Is that a banana or a gun, or, or whatever here? So I know that that's super fun to see that, except that, well, no, no, it's for real, right? Uh, because I'm also working uh, with companies dealing with uh, object and dangerous object detection. And for sure, we don't want the machine to be fooled. And that's also one of the, li of the limit of the AI, where the human beings are still super far more efficient to detect such issue. But the human being is also not as good in terms of long-term period, because the human being gets tired if you show a uh, human being. So many images per second, the user will say, oh, stop. Stop it. So there is a, a good compromise uh, to find between uh, the um, uh, AI and, and, and users. 
one of the solutions, and it will be almost one of the mass, my last slide, is using this system. So it's one of the possible solutions we can, we can envisage uh, where the user is well, dealing with supervision of AI algorithm, maybe, or we, are, we, we can have this uh, immersive analytics uh, rooms uh, where we can discuss and uh, collaborate, uh, even in VR. The thing that I like is uh, in terms of explainability, today we are a bit limited with the CNN network with this uh, filter pattern, so maybe that's a bit uh, too, too complex, but that uh, if you just open these black boxes, you end up with these small images that you can see here, which are compatible with our, our, our vision because the way we define this network are vision-based inspired. And so that's why the, 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 the inside of the network looks like something we can understand. And the science map is also very interesting because it tells you what part of the image triggers the most uh, about the classification. And uh, it could be, for instance, an issue with a proxy where you want to, uh, to detect polar bear and uh, the computer managed to detect this animal thanks to the snow, not thanks to the visualization of, of, of a bear, we call that a uh, proxy. Okay, so my last slide is about how to open these black boxes. I'm sure you understand it. One of the solution is well, to use data visualization. I say one of the solutions, maybe not, not the only one. Uh, you need to show the data. Then you can interact uh, with the data as a good way to support your decision uh, making. And uh, that's what we're trying to do uh, with this uh, explainable AI, XAI, that, uh, that I would be happy to show you maybe in the near future when we manage to get uh, relevant uh, results. So thanks. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I, I gave you too many things at once, I guess plenty of videos, and uh, I try to structure it a little bit. Uh, if you want to get deeper in all of this, so yeah, for sure there's this book about data storytelling. You have also this book about image-based visualization, but also you can have a look at uh, my Twitter account. It could be very helpful because every time I manage to uh, to, to, to find something interesting, I ship it here uh, regarding uh, immersive analytics, uh, VR, AR, or, or MR. So, thanks. Thank, thank you so much, Christophe. I, I mean, uh, I'm applauding virtually, and I think there are lots of people doing that. When, when I told everybody you, you do amazing things, I, I, was, I didn't really expect to do roller coaster on the NASDAQ. Which it was just for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but just for you too, uh, everyone, for the audience. <laughs> so, so thank you. I think it's it's really opened the mind of what is the research now, the, the you know the, the not the tendency, but the, the really the, the the top of the science in, in in visualization. And the question you raised have also very very deep implication in our lives and in the way we decide, in the way we we manage this amount of data. So we have some questions, and I'm very happy that you did this presentation with lots of videos and lots of data, because we had always question about big data. How can we handle big data? And, and you are handling big data. And so uh, Manuel asked us, uh, are these uh, video solution open source? Do they require exceptional computing resources? I think it's, it's really linked to the fact that yeah, it seems to be so smooth with your with your interactive uh, analysis of huge amount of uh, bank data, for example. How do you do it? <laughs> yeah, sure. So thanks for for for, for this question. And uh, yeah, big, big data is everywhere. And in fact, so before fully understanding, uh, uh, giving the, the answer of, of this question, I, I will say that uh, I, I discussed a lot with uh, at Microsoft Research regarding using big data or small data. And in fact. Uh, we have this argument where uh, sometimes they, they told me, why are you dealing with big data? Because even where we have small data, we don't know how to deal with them, right? We, we still are inventing uh, new tools uh, to, yeah, for Excel, for instance, where even if when you have 100 of data, how can you present that on a chart? So it's even complex. So why are you investigating big data? So, and, uh, and I say, you're not investigating big data because you know that it's, it's super difficult. It's super difficult because, because it's, it's, it's technically challenging in terms of uh, the graphic card or, or the, the technical limitation we have with this uh, hardware. And, uh, and, and this is a way to answer your question. 
for sure, for all of this, I'm using the graphic card. And then the graphic card is doing all the job and uh, there is no way to, to, to do it otherwise. And, um, and today, uh, there are a few companies that started to, uh, to, to think that way uh, as well. But I think the small data and big data are, are not connected. They are two different uh, uh, directions and they, they, they need different tools. Uh, for, for, for each of them. So for, for instance, edge bundling really works, but only if you have big data and uh, you, you don't want to do visual aggregation if you, you can clearly see the view, right? So, and then to, to fully under, uh, answer your question regarding the availability. Uh, so as I said, uh, it's hardware dependent. So, uh, and, and that's something I'm not super proud of because I would love that all my software and everything gets available to everyone. So, so if you go on my website, there are pieces of code uh, that you can try. And unfortunately, that, that's difficult. Yeah, for sure, because they are hardware dependent. But we are working super hard to find a way to unify everything and to provide a solution. So one of, of these, so we are working on that. I don't know how long it's going to take, but uh, for sure, the um, web technology drastically improved recently with we web, WebGL, uh, as previously mentioned. And we hope that it could be a good way uh, to go so that user could uh, use uh, this, uh, this big data visualization tool uh, in an easy way. Uh, but today, it's not, it's not for granted, it's not that easy. Okay, so thank you. Maybe um, another question from Miguel Portela is, uh, I, I don't know if it's really in your range, but uh, the question is which Python or R tools are available to uh, to use uh, or represent economic data in virtual reality? Is it feasible or to have this uh, connection? <laughs> sure, I think, sure. Uh, your, your presentation uh, motivates a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I'm always, uh, the thing is that I'm super busy, but if there's some money involved, I'm sure I can find some uh, some time. I'm just kidding about that. Uh, the 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 way to use virtual reality is not really specific to any type of data. So for sure, you can display what, uh, whatever type of data you want. Uh, for economical data, uh, usually there's a time involved, uh, and we call that time series for sure. And then we we face issues where uh, these lines. If you decide to show that with lines, I mean. Uh, virtual reality environment gives you a lot of space, but even though you don't have enough space to show all the temporal things, and, uh, and that's uh, one of the huge limitation of um, uh, of this temporal uh, data visualization. And that's why there are a lot of research going on uh, in this. So how can we aggregate, compress, expand, uh, simplify uh, time? And uh, maybe for economical uh, economical data, the the thing we are, we are working on is all these models. Uh, and uh, maybe it's worth it because uh, a model needs a lot of parameters and a lot of tweaking. And uh, adding the third dimension is not a super great idea what I'm going to say, but it, it gives you another availability, a possibility to help the reasoning. And uh, because on a 2D screen, you are limited by, by, by the size of your screen. But imagine in VR, you have multiple screens that could be piled on top of each other. So, it, and you also have plenty of space to spread all the models or things like that. So this is maybe one of the assets you can consider uh, regarding uh, model tweaking or model understanding. And maybe a very sh short question and, and please a short answer on, on do, do we need to learn how to visualize in, in VR? Because we, we already know that we need to learn how to visualize some, some data in 2D, some, some visualizations of graphics in 2D. So is it a more difficult in, in VR? Mm -hmm. So the paper we had with this uh, dear data uh, showed that at least for pictograms in, in 2D or in 3D, it could be, could be the same. But this issue about visual literacy is very important. And uh, thanks for, for, for the question. There is an open field here. And uh, we don't know yet uh, the, the, this answer. We have uh, small pieces of answer. And uh, inside that told us, yeah, it seems even easier because uh, we reduce the gap between you, our 3D actual environment and this 3D virtual environment. So it could ease at some point uh, the, the understanding of the data, except that data is sometimes abstract. So we don't 
we don't have the same equivalent in uh, in our actual world. So yeah, I mean that's super interesting research that has to be conducted. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe. I think you, this, this journey into visual complexity that you provide here uh, reminds me the, the, the world of Turkey that we see what we never expected to see in, in the world you have presented here and with the tools you presented. So I think it's, 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 it was really well suited with what Alberto Caro said on the first day about, about what is data visualization. Thank you very much. Thank what you. I'm proposing to everybody, uh, uh, of course, to applaud you and to go to your website and to read the books you mentioned, like uh, this one you mentioned that you, you, you're a big fan of, and this one that you write that I'm a, I'm a big fan of. Thank you again, Christophe. Thank you. That's really, really, really great.